the class is this book in his image. Um, they do have them in the resource center. They bought 30 books, so there should be quite a few out there. There are $8 out there. That's currently cheaper than Amazon. Um, you don't need the book, but I do recommend it. So, you know, like I said, this is the book. It's a Jen Wilkin book. Also, it looks real girly. It's not a girly book. Like, I don't know why they chose flowers. Um, I, I definitely think a man could read it as well. So, um, but they might not want to, so tear the cover off and hand it to them without the cover. So there's that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us this opportunity to come and learn and worship together. I'm just so grateful for you bringing this group of ladies in here for us to have this intimate moment with you this morning. And in your name I pray, amen. So like I said, this is the book um, that we're doing. It's in his image. So do you all spend time thinking about uh, God's character how we as Christian women are called to reflect those same communicable attributes. Theologically, communicable refers to things about God that are also meant to be true about us as Christians. This is where, um, I think back to Marcia's study, I don't know how many of you all were in Marcia's study, but like her kind of catchphrase was, you know, ring the me out. Like if you had a, I'm about ready to show how old I am, a tea towel. <laughs> <laughs> um, like if you had a tea towel and you like wring it out, you're wringing that water out, wring the me out of something. Well, that's what you want to do. Um, you're asking the Holy Spirit to help you wring the me out of whatever. So would you all say you're naturally patient or loving or good? I know I can't say those things. Our brokenness and sin requires the Holy Spirit because otherwise we just wouldn't naturally reflect those attributes. So some of us can like also um, see that people focus on a morality reflection of God's character. That's just kind of like keeping up appearances. Those people also become unapproachable and unrelatable to others, especially lost people. Haven't you also seen someone that you thought, oh gosh, they just appear to be such a good Christian role model, but then upon closer inspection, you just really realize they're reflecting their own personal preferences and they're labeling it as a Christian standard. They might know the contents of the Bible, but they don't really know him. Anyone can quote scripture, but also anyone can misquote scripture. Moral truths can also be subjective and malleable to the source. A human. By studying God's attributes as revealed in Scripture and seen in flesh in Christ, Christians can properly understand the ways in which God calls us to reflect His holy character. Jen does a great job in her book at pointing readers to a God they can know and a God who calls His people to image Him in their daily lives. So, has anyone in here ever said, I just want to know what God's will is for my life? I've said that so many times. I'm frankly sick of hearing myself say it. But God's will isn't just that narrow view of circumstances or a season or just an individual life. We look to God in our decision making for ourselves. We should pray about everything, but we also just can't get into the habit of using God kind of like as that magic eight ball, like, should I buy this car? Or should I, okay, you shake that magic eight ball and you're like, should I stay at this job or should I take a different one? And this and that, presenting the two best options to God and waiting on which one we think is the best answer and the only acceptable one. So instead of asking, you know, what's God's will for my life, what we should be asking is, uh, what should I, do? instead of asking the what should I do questions, we should be asking a better question, who should I be? When we ask this question first, we're consequently driven to know more about who God is and how he has related to us in Christ and how we should live as his people. We need to be like the very image of God. When we reflect on what our lives were like apart from Christ, we tend to focus on the poor decisions we made and their consequences. Um, when I say apart, um, I don't necessarily mean before you were saved, because some people in this room were, were probably saved when they were really young children. I just mean even making decisions as adults away from him. Because there's a lot of times as an adult that I've made decisions without going to him and prayerfully asking him what I should do, and I end up making a really boneheaded decision. 
So what we want to do is we want to really focus on what our heart, making sure our heart is right. We need to focus on our actions. If we focus on our actions without addressing our hearts, we're just going to end up as better behaved lovers of self. And we don't need to do that. I can base the right answer on what I think is right. Uh, we once bought a used car. Um, from the moment we got it, the car was just a complete lemon. I realized after a lot of thought, um, I bought the car because what I thought it said about me. I'm embarrassed to say that, but that is, that's true. That's something I struggle with. Um, and I get how funny that is because I just told you the car's a lemon and I bought it because I thought it said something about me. <laughs> So our feelings deceive us and our self-logic uh, betrays us. I had old feelings and wants that lingered in my heart, and Satan used those for a used car purchase. That's just dumb. Like, it's just a really dumb little thing. But he got in there. I didn't pray about the car. I just knew I wanted it. And it was a valuable and really expensive lesson for me to make sure that my heart's right. So when we study God's attributes, it can't just be some academic exercise. It should change how we relate to him and to others. Um, I grew up in small town, Georgetown. That was pre-Toyota days. This meant everyone knew to whom I belonged. Um, and I don't know if you all saw my Facebook post, but this face is my dad's. And <laughs> it's really apparent who I belong to. Um, because everyone knew who I belonged to, I knew I couldn't do certain things or say certain things because I was a reflection of my father. If I did something wrong or said something ugly, how would people view him? Are we concerned about how our actions and words reflect our heavenly father? Furthermore, are we showing the example that God is enough? Studying God's communicable attributes drives us to properly reflect his image in our lives as we see Christ as the perfect example, example of the image of God, we'll uh, discover how God's own attributes impact how we live, leading to freedom and purpose as we follow his will and are conformed to his image. God wants us to be living proof. So in this book, there's going to be three key, key insights. Again, I don't think you all really need the book. Um, it, it actually was kind of hard to do this particular study because I think she covered every topic so well. Have, has anyone read the book yet? I mean, it's just so good. And I just sat there and thought, I don't even know what I could contribute. And I just thought, I'm just going to stand up here and read a chapter each week because it really is good. I hope that you all get it. Um, in the book, there are really personal study questions at the end of each chapter. Um, I feel like they're maybe too personal for us to even do in a group. Maybe you all could have a close friend and break off and kind of do those. But the, the questions are really good. So I do encourage you all to get the book. But there's three key insights from it. And the first is he's the perfect example. This study is going to shed light on who God is. It's a proper understanding. Um, a proper understanding of God is necessary for properly reflecting his character. Again, we don't read the Bible to know who we are, but to know who he is. In Tanya's class, a few months ago, she walked through Jen Wilkins' book, uh, None Like Him. Again, another flower. Um, so they have this in the resource as well. Uh, the Resource Center as well. I think it's the same price, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it explored the incommunicable attributes of God. These are the attributes that God does not share with his creation. So I wrote those on the board just, um, I think almost all of you all were in the class. So those were the attributes that she covers in that book. And these are the ones that are going to be in this study that we're covering. Um, but like I said, I, I would encourage you all to get the book. And none like him, we were shown how God's utterly and uniquely different than mankind. And that's a good thing. Um, the class, this really isn't a sequel, but you're not going to be able to appreciate the impact of sharing the characteristics we have with God until we understand how much we don't have in common. In this study, we're going to look at the communicable attributes of God, which he shares with man. We definitely need to understand he is utterly different from man. Divine love is far greater than any human expression of love can or ever will be. Yet man is still able to love like God, albeit as an imperfect reflection of his love. 
So any discussions of who should I be as it relates to Christians being re-imaged by God must begin with a proper understanding of who God is. God's the perfect source from which all his attributes flow. For us to be holy, good, loving, merciful, just, graceful, faithful, patient, truthful, and wise, we must first see these attributes come from our perfect God. So the second key insight from this book is he's the perfect example. A proper understanding of God is necessary for properly reflecting his character. Scripture tells us that Christ is the exact imprint of God's nature. In Hebrews 1.3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. In Christ, we're able to see a physical manifestation of, of what God is like. For example, if we want to know what God's patience looks like, we should observe Jesus' time with his disciples during his earthly ministry. Look at how patient he is through their lack of understanding, doubting, and even denying. When asked to see the Father, Jesus' response was, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That's John 14, 9. The same is true for Christians today. To see the attributes of God on display, we can look to Christ. Christ being the exact imprint of God displays God's attributes perfectly. As God re-images us, it's essential that we consistently look to the only human who never sinned. Christ is the only perfect one through whom God's attributes are on full display. If believers are being conformed to the image of his son, we must study the son's life if, we're ever ex if we ever expect to reflect God's character well. And you don't need Jen Wilkins' book to do that. Y'all just need your Bible to do that. So let's be clear. I certainly don't want you going to just someone's book and reading. You need to go here first, and that is strictly just a supplement to learning. So the third key insight is how should we live? A proper understanding of God's character perfectly displayed in Christ will inevitably change the lives of Christians. After spending time studying God's attributes and specifically how we're displayed in Christ, we must give careful thought to how we can show these attributes in our everyday lives. As we study each of these 10 communicable attributes, we have to be thinking, how will I reflect this character of God today? The application of these attributes will differ from believer to believer because we're just different with different circles of influence and life experiences. This thing does not turn well, so this might get real weird real, real fast. I'm just going to pick it up. Do I look muscular? There we go. Okay. So what we need to do is when we're thinking about those attributes um, each week, today we're going to cover one. But in the subsequent weeks, we are going to cover two per week. So what we need to do is actually fill in how this is going to change. So today, we're doing holy. So again, you need to be thinking, how am I going to reflect this character of God? How should the knowledge that God is holy change the way I live? And then we also need to say, how should the knowledge that God is holy change the way I relate to others? So again, today I thought we'd only cover holy, and it's a doozy. And I can't even <laughs> scratch the surface in an hour. So I think let's just kind of think about like what the general definition is of holy. Does anyone want to throw it out? She said perfect pure, sinless. The definition um, in the dictionary is dedicated or consecrated to God uh, for a religious purpose, sacred. And the adjective is holy. The comparative adjective is holier. The superlative adjective is holiest. Therefore, holiness is the state of being holy. 
This attribute sets God apart from created beings. It refers to his majesty and his perfect moral purity. There's no sin or evil thought in God at all. His holiness is the definition of that which is pure and righteous. So uh, why don't you all tell me some phrases that you remember your parents saying to you? I'll start. Uh, My dad likes to say, welcome to the real world. So... That's not funny. I don't like it when he says it. Um, (laughs) uh, I also like to, I I think life should be fair. And my dad always says, who told you life was fair? Um, He also likes to say this to me, even at the age I am now, it isn't about you. So what, what have your all's parents said that you remember? Yeah, I don't, I don't like it when parents say that. Like that kind of feels like welcome to the real world. Yeah. Uh Pat. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Hit me with it. Oh, yeah. I've heard that one numerous times. Yeah. We're on the same page with that. Wait, have you heard that or have you said that? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of already knew that answer. I just wanted you to say that. So. <laughs> okay. I could, I could hear Papa saying that right now. That's for sure. Yeah. So we repeat what we want others to remember, and we learn what we hear repeated. Following the rule of repetition, the Bible wants our first thought about God to be that he is holy. The word holy almost appears 700 times in the Bible. In the verb form, sanctify, it appears an additional 200 times. No other attribute is joined to the name of God with greater frequency than holiness. Again, God's holiness, his utter purity of character is what distinguishes him. Um, In Exodus 15, 11, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. And from Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel 2, 2, there's none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. We hear the angel saying, holy, 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 without ceasing. Um, R.C. Sproul, is that how you say that? That sprawl, 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 yeah. There we go. He wrote, uh, only once in, I said it kind of country, sprawl. Only once in sacred scripture is an attribute of God elevated to the third degree. Only once is the characteristic of God mentioned three times in secession. The Bible says God is holy, holy, holy. Not that he's merely holy or even holy, holy. He is holy, holy, holy. The Bible never says that God is love, 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 or mercy, 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 or wrath, 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 or justice, justice, justice. It does say that he is holy, 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 that the whole earth is full of his glory. We repeat what we want remembered and what is most important and what is most easily forgotten. It's easy for most people to grab onto the love parts of the Bible. It's easier to emphasize this because everyone wants to feel welcomed and loved. Um, We also uh, can emphasize justice because everyone wants justice and they want people to behave. Those are attributes most people can get on board with. Holiness is harder for people to grasp and understand because it restricts and turns away from pleasures of the world. Um, I get that. Our world says, you do you or do what makes you happy. Um, That's fleeting and it's ever-changing. The word happy comes from the word happenstance, which is based on the word circumstance. And that's just fleeting, and that's just a moving target. So if you're doing what's going to make you happy, you're going to be all over the place. So how do we grow in holiness? Holiness is a harvest. Does anybody in here garden? I don't. I'm a killer. Okay. My, uh, my mom and my papa, they could grow anything at all. Um, they kind of just have that gift for knowing when the soil's right and where to plant the right things and the right location for the sun to hit it for the right amount of time and how to space it out for growth. I know how to show, show up and reap the benefits of the harvest. I asked my papa um, if he could show me how to garden like he was 
an amazing gardener. Um, and I asked him, I was like, could you show me how to, to plant a garden and do this? And he laughed and without missing a beat, he said, I think it'd just be easier if I just did it and just gave you the vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't wrong. It's hard to show someone how um, when all they're interested in is the end result, not the work it takes. So our family worked in tobacco, Burley, uh, when I was younger. I'm not getting into the good or the bad of the crop, just the extremely labor-intensive process. Um, it's often referred to as a 13-month crop. Do I have any tobacco people in here? Okay, y'all get it. Um, so forgive me, I'm just going to paraphrase this um, for the work that goes into the crop. So first what you do is you have some seeds, you scatter them on the soil where they're going to end up germinating. Um, they're planted when conditions are still cold and dark. This place is separate from where they will mature. This is, uh, they also have protection that gets placed over them while they begin to grow and take root. After they begin to grow, you gently pull the plant, roots and all, being sure not to bruise it for future growth. You place it in a way that it can be taken and set where they will begin to mature and grow. Pulling tobacco requires gentleness. This is also the start of the season of ceaseless labor. Um, setting tobacco, as you're pulling the plants, people are setting the, the plants so that they have enough room to grow. There's a new location for that. Once the plants grow for weeks and weeks, they get to a point where they need to be topped. This helps the plant to stop growing in one direction, but to mature in many. In this process, it begins to look different and you really start to notice. The changing of appearance happens fast. You shift from planting and nurturing to planning for the harvest. Once they reach a level of maturity, they're harvested and left to wilt, but this part has a purpose. Cutting is done in very uncomfortable conditions, but you gotta get them housed, which is being hung in the barn, and this requires a whole lot of strength. Housing tobacco allows the air to circulate and you dry out the leaves. Frankly, in my opinion, I don't think anything smells better than a tobacco barn. I just love the smell of that. I don't know, it just kind of smells like home. Um, sometimes the barn has to be wide open and other times it has to be closed, but they both serve a process, a, a purpose in the process. So after about two months, the curing process is near completion and this requires patience. And then, Stripping tobacco. This happens when times are super cold and you're just chilled to the bone in the barn. It's just flat out cold. I still remember my mom had these coveralls and she had a hole worn in them right here where you'd hold the stock right here. It's also funny if no one works in tobacco and you go someplace else and you say, well, my mom's in the stripping room. <laughs> <laughs> You have to really clarify what you're talking about if people aren't tobacco people. But when you're stripping tobacco, you're pulling the leaves off, and each one has value and worth. You just have to know where to put it, and this requires discernment. And then they're off to fulfill their purpose. Keen eyes see what they need and what they'll be used for. The difference between a person who grows in holiness and one who does not isn't based on personality, upbringing, or gifting. The difference, difference is what each of us plants into the soils of our heart and soul. Are you all planting grudge seeds? Um, are you planting rows of discontent that you have to tend to? Are you planting seeds of joy or compassion? How can you harvest what you never bothered to plant or tend to? Holiness isn't for the spiritual elite. I think a lot of us can just instantly think of those people that you're just like, oh, I don't, I don't know if I could ever be like them. Holiness is a lifetime crop, and it takes a lifetime of labor. It's for every single one of us. I want you all to turn to Galatians 5, 16 through 17. I kind of toggle back and forth between the ESV and the NIV. So um, sometimes, like, if the words are different than what you all have, those are the two Bibles that, that I kind of reference back and forth. So Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. We sow to the flesh whenever we do something that strengthens or provokes our sinful desires. So how do we do that? How do we sow to the flesh whenever we do something that strengthens or provokes our sinful desires? 
Is it Facebook stalking? What, what do you all think? How do we sow to those sinful desires? Is it maybe looking through magazines and just having those feelings of inadequacy? You know, because you don't measure up to what you're seeing in a magazine or your house doesn't look like that house and you don't have that rug or you don't have that kitchen cabinetry. Um, is it jealousy when you're looking through Instagram pictures of other people's homes? Um, how do we sow to the spirit whenever we strengthen our spirit-inspired desires for holiness? How do we do that? Do we encourage each other? Do we reach out? Do we make sure that we surround ourselves with like-minded people to push us towards God? So what does it mean to live a holy life? Leaving aside the possibility of being perfectly holy, it means to live a life that's set apart from the secular world. A Christian, for instance, who's living a holy life avoids and resists the temptation to sin and focuses his or, or her attention and energies on God and good works. The more we grow in holiness, the more we grow to hate our sin. Eugene Peterson's an author, and he wrote, God cannot fit into our plans. We must fit into his. We can't use God. God's not a tool or an appliance or a credit card. Holy is the word that sets God apart and above our attempts to enlist him in our wish fulfillment fantasies or our utopian schemes for making our mark in the world. Holy means that God is alive on God's terms, alive in a way that exceeds our experience and imagination. Holy refers to life burning with an intense purity that transforms everything it touches into itself. So we're to have transformed character. Believers are set apart to be his special people. Christ's followers do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus said, this is Romans 12, 2 and John 17, 16. So what's worldliness? It's more than what one does. Worldliness is not restricted to just those in the world. It's among the challenges we even have right here in church. Whatever we love or live for more than Christ is of the world. The spirit-filled heart does not take on the spirit of today's wants. When character is transformed, changes happen to our direction, our lives, our behavior, our conversations, our destination. If we aren't pursuing Christ, we're pursuing something. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, We submit to being transformed into his image. This relationship's not going to be static. We're constantly abiding in him. The dialogue between the spirit and the followers of Christ, where the spirit is creating and shaping us into the image of God, continues. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. This also alludes to the importance of our prayer life. For those with kids, doesn't it drive you bonkers when you know something's going on and you just want to help or advise or intervene, but they say nothing, so you just kind of sit back and watch this unfold? Um, or maybe you have parents who need something or help, and then they don't ask you for help, and you know you could have helped, and they won't let you help. <clears throat> so, yeah, that. So, <laughs> so we, were, we remain pure only as the Holy Spirit, moment by moment, continues to cleanse our hearts and transforms us into his image. So how many of y'all been having that decent day and then like blammo, someone says something that just touches that hidden hurt that you carry, that they don't even know that you have it, but they said that thing that just touches that nerve. Or someone hurt your kid. And then you suddenly feel like the heat of a thousand suns and you want retribution. The Holy Spirit renews and works on us every day. Every day we need him. We have to be a living proof of a holy God. Those hidden hurts will become more manageable because we aren't looking for man to fix them, but we're allowing the Holy Spirit to abide in us and we're going to manage those differently because of him. A holy and transformed person has a repentant spirit. It means that along the journey, there's a confession and a repentance, although there is a pure heart instantly. 
there is a yielding and obedience to continuous transformation. So has anyone seen um, taffy, like hand taffy being made or pulled? At first, it's just a giant hard blob. It's just completely unyielding. And it requires a lot of working and strength and effort to make it pliable and workable. Our hearts are that way. And we can be hardened. We don't want to be used. We trust our hurts more than the holy healer. We'll carry a grudge for a lifetime, but we won't carry an invitation to church to a neighbor. Holiness and wholeness are closely related, and God wants the whole of your life, not just your Sundays. So we're also to have an engagement in God's mission. God took the initiative to live in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. We must take the initiative to engage in what is broken around us. This engagement, and um, this is... This engagement is an incarnational expression of personal and social holiness. We are a living form and living proof of God's holiness. We join with God in his purposes. Together, we should engage in ministry among the poor and marginalized. We should reach out and have multicultural and multilingual circles of friends. So you all need to look at your circle of influence. Do you all remember what your circle of influence is? It's like those around you. So uh, picture math class or drafting. We had to take drafting. Did you all have to take drafting when you were in school? We had to do that. Yeah, of course you did. Um, (laughs) You would be the one that I expect to say that. So, but you all know what a drawing compass is, right? Like, because you took math. Um, So you all just picture this. You're the point and the pencil draws the circle around and you can adjust that to be wider and wider or smaller or smaller, but it's your choice. You're the one that's in control. So you're the point and your circle is the circle of influence. Your circle of friends should be as diverse as your circle of influence. Heaven's not going to look like this class. So Another thing is when our leaders of our church or a spiritual mentor starts to push you to find a place of ministry, there's a reason. Anyone ever felt pushed out of their comfort zone in this way? I laugh because she's going to be teaching a class and that's out of her comfort zone, so I feel her. Um, This is actually funny. Um, My example when I was working on this, I started working on this around Christmas time was the butlers, and I'm looking at Patty's sweet face right now, so isn't that funny? It worked out that way. (laughs) The butlers, for you all don't know, that's Patty, um, are our church planners in San Francisco, and they actually did this very thing to me, and I use this word. I've told Patty this before, so it I felt like I was being interrogated when they did this to me. (laughs) And I'll never forget, we were all in Johnny Colette's class, and Johnny um, wasn't there that Sunday, and so we went into Todd's class, and after Todd's class, um, I, I mean, it was so weird because Brett and Patty just scooted right over to me on a chair and just started pelting me with questions. And I was like, what are they doing? And I'm like, where is Daniel? And he's like, I'll see you later. And so I just was like sitting there with Brett and Patty and they're asking me all of these questions. You know, what are you doing? What do you think your calling is? Where do you think that you all are going to go? Where should you all serve? And I just was like, what is going on? And what was funny is I started feeling super defensive. Like I got defensive. I got upset at Brett and Patty because I just thought, that's my business. What do they think they're doing? And it was just like, we kind of wrapped it all up and I walked away and I just was like, I felt all hot and like I had hives. And then I just went out my car and cried because I felt like I just got interrogated. And um, God was using the butlers. Sorry. I'm just really appreciative. But God was using the butlers to take me to usher me, well, drag me, (laughs) Um, I really wasn't a willing participant, um, into a stage of growth. And it was hard. It was really hard, but he used them. um, And they contributed for Daniel and us to go to Haiti. And it's just like, you know, if I had to say, oh, who are the people that, you know, mostly changed our lives, our spiritual lives, I'd say Brett and Patty. So it's... um, 
when someone's pushing you, it's for a reason, and Satan's going to get in there because he knows what you struggle with, and he's going to make you feel defensive. So you all have to be real careful and understand what that other person's doing. God's using them. So I just also think, you know, there just hasn't ever been a time where God has stopped and said, you know, I really should ask Jennifer what she thinks. I need to make sure that she's going to be comfortable with this, you know. He's never done that. So, of course, he's going to use them to make me feel uncomfortable to get me to that next level. When our hearts are purified by faith and our affections are set on God, it's our spiritual longing to find a place of service to advance the kingdom of Christ throughout the world. This call to missional engagement is based upon the call of God. So another thing is healthy relationships. Like you've got to make sure that you keep those relationships right. And it's a characteristic of holy people, a holy church. Holy people get along with each other. Holy people should be the easiest people in the world to get along with. So would those who know you say that you all are the easiest person to get along with? Don't ask Daniel. Yeah, because of healthy relationships, there's unity. If there's no unity, there's no power. This has to do with purposeful unity, not just everyone being alike to be alike. Holy people disagree, but they don't destroy. Holy people desire to connect people with Christ, not condemn people in Christ. When we understand the sanctifying of relationships, our teaching of Christian holiness, it's not a setup. This unity in relationships is based on the unconditional and holy love of God. We subscribe to the theology of love, not performance. The basis is the love, grace, and mercy of God himself, which is lived out in our relationships. In humility, like Christ, we serve one another. As imitators of Christ, we empty our rights in submission to God's rights. We abandon our way for God's way. Holy people empty themselves of themselves to serve God's purposes. And again, I hear Marcia say, you got to ring yourself out. You know, when those things rise up, all of us have different struggles. When they rise up, just picture that, you know, that tea towel or hand towel, and you're just wringing yourself out of that because you know that's a moment that you probably need patience and you need the Holy Spirit. Call on him. Self-absorption leaves no room for quality relationships. If you're only searching for your own comfort or preferences, you probably aren't going to develop meaningful relationships because relationships require sacrifice and forgiveness and compromise and love. Parents get this. Married people get this. Daughters get this. Friends get this. Um, Together, the people of God seek his purposes and serve one another. When we do this, we reflect the image of God who is self-giving holy love. Restored self. Salvation is the restoration of God's image in us. In every person, there's a potential image of God. People are broken, but God can put them back together again. No one is so lost that he or she can't be found. No one is so bad that he or she cannot be redeemed. No one is so far gone that he or she cannot come back. But Satan tells us otherwise. Holiness is about God's nature transforming our nature to be like his nature. We don't celebrate sin. We celebrate God's grace that can purify and wholly sanctify and empower his people with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Men and women can be restored in the image of God, his image of Christlikeness. His image is self-giving, holy love. God can rescue us from ourselves as we abandon ourselves to the sanctifying and purifying work of the Holy Spirit. We are chosen of God to reflect the image of God. So I'm going to go ahead and have you all turn to the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is uh, grounded in the truth that God is holy. To say that God is holy means that he is completely separate from all evil and defect. Or to put it another way, God's completely and perfectly good. The Lord is worthy of total allegiance and exclusive worship and loving obedience. Israel's identity arises because by God's actions, they are holy. 
yet also because the Lord expects Israel to act holy in, particular, in practical ways. Israel is called to be holy because the Lord himself is holy. So in Leviticus 11, I'm going to have you all jump down to verse 44 and 45. So Leviticus 11, 44, 45. <clears throat> I'm the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to, to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. Hop down to Leviticus 19.2. Nineteen two. Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Hop down to Leviticus 27. Maybe we should have them read it for us. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. Leviticus 27, consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am the Lord your God. Hop down to Leviticus 21.8. Regard them as holy because they offer up the food of your God. Consider them holy because I, the Lord, am holy. I who make you holy. The seemingly disparate laws of Leviticus that deal with the ritual, ethical, and commercial and penal aspects of life all rest on this core notion of holiness. Holiness in Leviticus is not separation for separation's sake, but for the sake of a thriving community of the people of God and the reconciliation of each person to God. Holiness is not only about an individual's behavior following regulations, but about how what each person does affects the whole people of God in their life together and their work as agents of God's kingdom. In this light, Jesus calls for his people to be salt and light to outsiders, and this makes complete sense. I'm going to have you uh, hold Leviticus, but flip over to Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. <clears throat> you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. To be holy is to go beyond the law uh, and to love your neighbor and to even love your enemy and to be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So you can see Matthew 5.48 is echoing Leviticus 9.2. Um, in ancient Israel, um, they did not obey the laws in Leviticus as just like some peculiar sets of regulations, but as an expression of God's presence in their midst. This is as relevant to God's people today as it, is, as it was then. In Leviticus, God is taking a collection of nomadic tribes and shaping their culture as a people. Likewise today, when God's people enter their places of work or school or neighborhoods, just all the places we go, through them, God is shaping our cultures and our work units and our organizations and our communities, our circles of influence. God, we are influencing them. God's call to be holy is a call to shape our cultures for good and for his purposes. We're to serve the Lord in a life of holiness. We need to start uh, taking sin more seriously, too. I think what we can kind of do is sometimes just be like, oopsie, did I do that? Sorry. Well, I'm human. And then you just kind of move on and just forget it like it was absolutely nothing. We also get into the habit of unconsciously thinking um, or making certain sins worse than others. And that's not true. In the Old Testament, Ezra sees the people of God sinning and he pulls his hair and beard out. Could you imagine if we saw someone just start doing that in Kroger? We, I mean, like, we wouldn't think, oh, gosh, you know, he's burdened by sin. 
Like we would just think, oh, that person's crazy, whatever. Um, when Nehemiah sees the people of God sinning, he beats them. And on other people, he actually rips their hair out. Leviticus shows us that God does not think, is, God does not think sin is just like an oops, sorry. Just consider the impact of carrying out God's instructions um, for uh, offering, burnt offerings, sin offerings, guilt offerings. There's all different kinds of offerings in the book of Leviticus. But, and I do recommend you all read uh, Leviticus chapters uh, 1 through 3. I wish we had time to read all of them, but we don't. So uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to read Leviticus 1, verse 3 through 5. When you start reading Leviticus and you read one, chapters 1 through 3, you really realize how removed you are from the daily sin in your life. And I think that if you don't, then you need to go back and reread those. Um, but like I said, we're going to read uh, Leviticus 1, 3 through 5. <clears throat> if the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to offer a male without defect. He must present it to the entrance of the tent of a meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. He is to lay the hand on the head of the burnt offering and to be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He is to slaughter the young bull before the Lord and then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and sprinkle it against the altar on all sides to the entrance at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And then it just goes on and like I said, it goes through grain offerings, guilt offerings, sin offerings. I mean, could... Do you all, like, really imagine that? Like, you have sinned, and now you just, like, what if you had to go get a calf? Um, most people also had, like, one robe. You know, they had one robe. They might have, like, the Muslim undergarment, but they had one robe. And I don't know if y'all have ever even just been around a campfire. You have to wash your clothes. You have to wash your hair. It gets into everything. So just imagine, like, you have to slaughter a calf, and you have that one robe. Okay, now you know you're completely covered in this blood. Fires are not clean. You're also getting dirty from fires. Um, this goes on to say in Leviticus, uh, it talks about, um, if you look down, it talks about birds. You're wringing their necks and tearing them open by their wings. People also had to break the clay pots that they used. They didn't have a target to just go and replace this really valued vessel that they have. I mean, you would really seriously <laughs> think twice about sinning if the only pot your family had, you had to break it because you were making, you were off making an offering. The vivid reality of animal sacrifices made it difficult to take sin lightly. As we reflect on these instructions, we can see how they foreshadow a far more substitutionary sacrifice, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son. Because God takes our sin that seriously, we should too. Be holy as the Lord is holy. In all the universe, only God possesses a flawless character. He cannot be measured against a higher moral standard. He's the absolute standard of all perfection and purity. As fallen human beings, we can barely begin to understand God's complete sinlessness. In fact, the closer we draw to him, the more aware we become of our own sinful condition. In today's world, it seems sin's just an outdated concept. Leviticus reminds us what reminds us that God's holiness is real, undeniable, and just as, as deserving of our reverence, respect, and worship today as it was in the days of Moses or past. Leviticus details how the Israelites were to relate to their holy God, living out commands conveyed in what some Bible scholars have called the holiness code. God expected his people to be noticeably different from their neighbors, and he sharply distinguished between proper worship of himself and the offensive customs of neighboring people who serve little g gods only a holy god desires a holy people so how can we live a holy life uh, when the world around us is unholy the first thing is disconnect disconnect from the world to live a holy life do not be conformed to this world romans 2 12 2 the Bible warns us again and again that there should be a definite line between us and the world. This means our thoughts, our actions, our words, behaviors are noticeably different, and we should look like Jesus. 1 Peter 1.15, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. 
To be set apart means we're not living like the world, not thinking like the world, not sick like the world, not broke like the world, not without resources and power like the world, not engaging in sin like the world. Instead, we're separated from the world and walking with God in his ways. These things are still going to happen. This is not a health and wealth message. That is not going to happen. We are still going to get sick. We're still going to be broke. Things are still going to happen to us, but we're going to walk through them with hope and understanding that God is our one true God. So how can we do this? A lot of it has to do with what we're ingesting. If we spend a lot of our time watching um, television, you know, whatever shows we just want to watch, looking through social media, hanging out with unbelievers, you're unequally yoked to the world. And it's going to have an effect on you, whether you believe it or not. These things seem fairly harmless individually, but when you start putting all these things together, they just start to really blur the lines a bit. In this world, sexual sin, violence, foul language, drunkenness, they're just all celebrated because, you know, people are, you do you, you only live once, YOLO. Um, But Christian values are getting laughed at more and more. That's why 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? This verse applies to marriage, but it also applies in all your relationships as well. We should minister to non-Christians, but you have to understand there is a difference between having um, fellowship and a relationship with these people, and you need to understand those boundaries. We need to have these relationships to share the good news with non-Christians. Scripture's telling us Um, It's not good to have ongoing fellowship with them. It doesn't say don't have a relationship with them. We should be reaching out to them and, and drawing them closer to him. Don't hang out with people and let your hair down with a group. And they really will start having a negative effect on you. Don't convince yourself because you aren't participating, but you're present, then you're just in the all clear. You're not. Sometimes it can feel challenging to be set apart because it means we stand out. And God knew ahead of time that this would involve persecution. The world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. John 17, 14. But remember, great blessings and honor come to those who are persecuted for his sake. But, you know, like we need to get real. I doubt anyone in this room has ever genuinely suffered persecution for his sake. I'm sure some of us have been excluded or had our feelings hurt. I know I have. But we have such freedoms and luxuries, especially in this country, that Satan uses those freedoms and luxuries to blind us into such a comfortable state that we feel like when our feelings are getting hurt, we're labeling that as persecution. It's not. So in 1 John 2.15, it says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world... Love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. You were taken and lifted out of darkness. You were separated. You were severed. Now you can go back in the darkness if you want to. The devil can't make you go back into the darkness without your consent, and God won't make you stay in the light. It is definitely your choice. Colossians 1.13, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Hebrews 12.14 gives us a warning and an encouragement. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. If we want to live a holy life, we have to be disconnected from the world and its ways and be connected to God and his ways. So is it really possible for us to be holy? We can because we're born again. When that happened, we were separated to God on the inside. God expects us to walk that separation so that it will take effect on the outside as well. Holiness isn't this scary thing that only just like a few people, you know, that spiritual elite that they achieve. Like everybody in the body of Christ should walk in holiness. We've been given the robe of righteousness, but we have to maintain it. 
We have the Holy Spirit living inside us for that purpose. He directs us in holiness. The second thing we need to do is flee from temptation to live a holy life. Flee from temptation. Flee the evil desires, says 2 Timothy 2.22. You can resist any temptation that comes your way. We've got power. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, When you are tempted, God will also provide a way out. We must flee from temptation to live a holy life. And frankly, in this room of I don't know how many ladies are in here, what is going to tempt us, we probably, there's probably 30 different things that each of us would consider a temptation because we're all different. So it, it is really important to have that spiritual mentor, that friend, that person that holds you accountable, that can pull you back, that person that knows what your temptations are. So whose job is it to keep us pure? Whose job is it to straighten out things that are displeasing to God in our lives? We're not just victims. To flee from temptation, is it God's? Is God responsible? Was he at fault when Adam and Eve disobeyed him in the garden? No, he told them exactly what to do, and they had a choice, and they knew what they were doing. We have a choice, too. Let us cleanse ourselves, 2 Corinthians 7.1. We're temples of the Holy Ghost indwelt by the Spirit of God. So when our flesh rises up, the Bible says to crucify it. So what does that mean? That means you don't let your flesh just live the way it wants to live. You crucify it. When it wants to do or say things it, should, it shouldn't do or say, you say, body, shut up. <laughs> You're not going there. You're not doing that. I don't even want to hear that. And then you just shut it down. I think all of us have that tiny little voice that says, no, no, <laughs> or you shouldn't, and we have to make sure that we're attuned to that little whisper. It isn't a sin to be tempted. Sin is yielding to and acting on it. When temptation comes, it's often a thought that comes out of left field. Um, that's the devil seeing if you're going to go for it. So what do you do when that happens? There's an old saying that says, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from nesting in your hair. And that's exactly the way it is with thoughts from the outside. Those temptations coming to you from all directions. The third thing, obey the word of God to live a holy life. As we've already discovered, holiness is being separated to God. It's what you do with your life day by day. It's ordering your conduct according to the word of God and the promptings of the Holy Spirit. If you're separated to God, you're going to obey his word, not just some of the time and not just by obeying some of his commandments, but all the time, obeying all his commandments to the best of your ability. If you're living separated to God, disconnected from darkness, you're going to stand out and be distinguished. People could be born again, but they haven't disconnected from their old lives. They never spend enough time hearing from God, reading the word for themselves, praying, or learning how to listen to the Holy Spirit within themselves, teaching them how to be separate from the world. As a result, they never change on the outside, but the change on the outside is what enables us to walk free. It's when you change on the outside that you experience the blessings of God. When you change on the outside, you experience all that God provided for you when he saved you. That's when you're going to walk in holiness, and people are really going to take notice. Obeying the word is the same today as it's always been. Sin hasn't changed. God commandments, they haven't changed. The world and society and what they deem as acceptable is always changing. The love boat used to be scandalous. <laughs> I mean, it used to just embarrass me. And now I look at that and I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> um, so I think that that is ever going to be changing. And we have to be attuned to that because when we see that the world is always, it's always changing its meter of what's acceptable. God never does. He never, ever changes what he finds acceptable and what he expects from us. Obeying the word is the same today as it's always been. How comforting is it to know that God never changes? To live a holy life, we don't go by what the world says is good and right. Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 
Romans 12, 1 through 2. I'm sure a lot of you all have that memorized. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Is, his, is good, it's pleasing, and his perfect will. So next week, we're going to discuss God most loving and God most good. Let's pray. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, I ask for your help. Would you open our eyes and our hearts so it would stir up in us an understanding of your majesty? I know some of us are walking in really difficult situations in this room, just really painful times, and I know their hurt is real. I pray you grow our confidence in you because you are who you say you are. You are holy in power. You are holy in presence. And you are holy in your wisdom. And we are not alone. Lord, help us through your Holy Spirit who lives in us to be holy as you are holy. Stir in our hearts to know and believe this. We love you and are so grateful for our time with you. In your name I pray. Amen.